Well, welcome in the precious and glorious name of Jesus to Pure Art Ministries. My name is Robert Pears. In this episode, we want to look at the presence of the living God. Now, I'm working on a series, or at least a video, on the mystery of the church because I believe that we don't fully appreciate what it means regarding the church and being a member of the church. This glorious mystery that Paul would bring forth, that which was hidden and yet there. If we had eyes to see, we would have seen it, but because we were blind, we didn't. And many people walk in ignorance regarding the true mystery, power, and importance of the church. I believe that when you lay hold of that, it will change everything. But to appreciate the mystery of the church, you've got to understand the presence. And so I want to look at this because, again, this is a message that I believe if you get a hold of, it changes things. Because unfortunately for most of us, when we think of the presence of God, we simply think about the omnipresence, that God is everywhere. And we don't understand this term that I'm going to press in and look at today, the abiding presence. And the abiding presence is connected with the Shekinah glory, that powerful glory of the living God. When you look in the Old Testament, when the glory of God turned up, it brought holy fear. When I look in the New Testament, in revivals and awakenings, when the presence of God went beyond and in a region is like the presence of God came and fell and it was a divine assault. You see that Shekinah glory turn up and move and bring holy fear to the people. You can see the stories of people that come to mock and to taunt and how they're struck down as that glory of God, that Shekinah glory fills an area so that it went beyond the local church and it would impact an area or a region. There's something about the presence of God. And we've got to understand the difference between the abiding and the omnipresence. So let's press in, let's pray, and let's just come hungry to receive everything He has for us today. Amen? Father, we come in the name above all names, the name of Jesus. We ask of you to give us eyes to see, ears to hear, and a hearing heart. Open us, Father. Let us fully receive. Father, you give the press down, shaken together, overflowing measure, and we receive that today. Let your word dwell richly in us and transform us. Father, give us by your spirit, through your word, revelation of your abiding presence, and let it change us. Thank you, God, for such presence bread, that word from your heart that would minister life to each person listening and watching in the name above all names, the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. I'm glad you're hungry, and I'm glad you're thirsting. There's something about coming before the Lord, hungering and thirsting. So many of us come, and it's like you come to the restaurant, you've already eaten, you miss it all. And God's looking for people that are hungry and thirsty that come. God, I've come to receive. I want more. And they're desperate. There's something about holy desperation that just touches the Lord. And He just wants to pour in. God always has got so much more that He wants to give us. But we're so easily satisfied. Oh, that today we would come and be wholly disturbed. God, we want everything you've got. I want to know. I want to walk in this. Now, in Ephesians chapter 3, Paul wrote this in verse 7, of which I was made a minister according to the gift of God's grace, which was given to me according to the working of His power. To me, the least of saints, this grace was given to preach to the Gentiles the unfathomable riches of Christ and to enlighten all people as to what the plan of the mystery, which has for ages been hidden in God, who created all things so that the multifaceted wisdom of God might now be made made known through the church um, to the rulers and authorities in heavenly places. When you realize who you are, when we the church understand about the abiding presence in us, I'm telling you it brings a shout. It will change your spiritual warfare because you walk with an authority. You walk not in an arrogance, but in a boldness. And we then stop allowing the enemy to take ground. We're here to take it ourselves and press forward to expand his kingdom that others might have an encounter with the presence of God. 
Look at this in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 23. And he says, And he put all things under his feet, all things. And he gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. And in that verse, one of the things I want you to get hold of is the abiding presence of God in the church and how he is also omnipresent, filling all. Don't think of God abiding in you in light of the omnipresence. There is a radical difference between the abiding presence and the omnipresence. And I will also say regarding the abiding presence, you can walk with a veil between you and it as they did in the Old Testament and never really experience and encountering it and being transformed by it. Or you can, through the finished glorious work of the cross and faith in Jesus, experience that abiding presence and be able to come in face to face and know Him. Have such fellowship. For that was the purpose God created. And we think of the abiding presence, we have to go back to the garden where God walked in the garden with man and had fellowship. Man was created purposely for this fellowship. You and I are created, purposely designed, built in His image, to have fellowship with Him. You absolutely, 100% need it. You need it every single day. You need to be walking in this because that's how you were created. That's what you were made for. It is a necessary component to your life. If we walk as spiritual beings, we walk in the fullness of what He created us to be. And God wants you to be spiritually alive through what Jesus did on the cross and through an intimacy of fellowship in which He abides with you and in you. Now, let me continue here. So I want to start by sharing the omnipresence to show you that God is omnipresent. If you go to Proverbs 15, verse 3, The eyes of the Lord are in every place, keeping watch on the evil and the good. He's everywhere. And again, this has been our mindset regarding His abiding presence, and we're going to miss it if we do this. Jeremiah 23, verse 24. Can anyone hide himself in secret places so that I shall not see him, says the Lord? Do I not fill heaven and earth? There is nowhere you can run. Yet somehow we think if we do it in secret, it's not known. And we think we can hide it. I look at the fall and Adam and Eve recognizing in the inside of them knowing God knew, but somehow fooling themselves, trying to deceive themselves that they could hide it. But that very declaration of hiding and running was the very proof that they knew. And the reality is the presence, that omnipresence of God always brings with it an understanding of sin. And we know it. Every person knows that they're fallen short of the glory of God and the grace. And every person knows they need they just don't know that they need Jesus. And that's the purpose of the church. And when we press forward and we walk as carriers and conduits of the presence of God, we would stop walking in fear of the enemy because the God of victories is in us. The dread champion abides in us and with us. And the stronger strongman is in us and with us. If God is for us, who can be against us? And when you see that you are in His abiding presence, it makes diff all the difference. But when we fall down and simply see Him as omnipresent, it dilutes the abiding presence, and we don't grasp the fullness of what God has for us. In Psalm 139, it says in verse 7, Where can I go from your spirit, or where can I flee from your presence? You know, that's the reality. You can't, because He is everywhere. But what God wants is you to encounter with the abiding presence. That is a relationship with Him. And that relationship comes with the meeting of the person of and His abiding presence. Uh, the second point that I want to make out, so God, number one, is omnipresent. And number two, He does not abide uh, in a specific time or place. Okay, He can abide anywhere. He abides everywhere. And He abides at all times. As humans, 
and including the, the enemy, every created thing abides, everything on this earth, I should say, including the enemy, including Satan, including all the demons of hell, abide in a specific place tied to a specific time. The enemy is given specific times, in which case we're told, for example, the tribulation period, the seed or the son of the Antichrist um, is allowed to reign for a set period, seven prophetic months. Satan is tied to time. He's only allowed so much time and he knows it. We know from the word that he knows his time is running out. He is restricted to time. On this earth, there are seasons and we know everything will change. We are tied to time. And as much as we would love to step out of it, as long as you're on this earth, you're tied to time. And in fact, to live on this earth, you need to have a flesh vessel, which is again tied to time. Um, so going forward here, in Isaiah chapter 46, 10, talking about the Lord, declaring the end from the beginning, and from ancient times the things that are not yet done, saying, My counsel shall stand, and I will do all my pleasure. What I want you to see is this term, uh, well, two things here. First of all is that God declares the end from the beginning because He is infinitely aware of a 360 view of everything, of all time periods. So He knows fully what's going to happen. He knows how it's going to happen. God declares Himself as the great I Am. And he always refers to that. In fact, in the book of Revelation, when we are introduced, he has said that he is the God who was, who is, and is to come. Not who will be, but who is to come. And this is a powerful term because it is always referencing the fact that God is present tense. He is always present tense. He abides in this constant place of outside of time living present tense. When God turns up, He's not the God who was your provider. The God who was your healer, He is the God who is. When He introduced Himself to Moses, He says, I am who I am. I am always self-sufficient. I am always in existence, and I am always present tense. When Jesus was ministering, He also used that term and says, I am this term that can only be applied to God, because only God can walk in a place of being self-sufficient and existing present tense all the time. He always is, He always was, and He always will be. So God declares of Himself that He does not exist in a specific time, but He is outside of time. He can operate in time. Jesus came and subjected Himself and operated on time as in his earthly ministry. And in fact, God has set times. We see, for example, the set time Jesus came. And God does everything based on a set time in relation to man and his dealings with man and, of course, the enemy. But God himself abides outside of time. This is something that we as humans don't understand because we, from the very moment you were born, until you meet him, you will abide in time. And you will find that you're always at a specific place. You are not omnipresent. Uh, in 1 Peter 1, verse 20, He indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifested in these last times for you. So God, Jesus, in the eternal past, before we were created, had foreordained Jesus would come and die for you. God knowing infinitely the future. He knows you perfectly, and He knows everything about you. He declared in the intimate, you know, infinite past His perfect plan to redeem you. You know, sometimes I look and I'm like, God, I just, I just wish you would come. You know, I just wish this was over and we were living in the millennium or, or living in the new heaven, new earth. And then I have to look at the Lord God who in the infinite past lived in this, longing for that day longing for this place where we will walk, but because He doesn't live in time, it is different. In Lamentations 3, verses 22 through 24, Through the Lord's mercy we are not consumed, because His compassion fail not. 
They are new morning, so they're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul, therefore I hope in Him. And I, I want you to understand that God, in dealing with man, comes every day with fresh mercies from His presence. He calls on us to experience Him every day. That we would have such a dependency upon Him. Because while we live in time, we need to understand that we need every moment to have this abiding now relationship with Him, which is how He reveals Himself always now and I am. That you need a now relationship with Him and now a fellowship with Him. You cannot build or live upon what was in the past or what you will do in the future. What you did in the past got you to this place, good or bad. But it's what you're doing today that's so important. And we need to be found always in this now relationship with Him and with His abiding presence. Amen? He is our daily bread. It's interesting that our Father, the model prayer that Jesus gave, we are to pray to our Father where? Who arts in heaven. And that's the next thing I want to lay hold of is that God abides in specific places. We are told clearly that He is in heaven. And we see that throughout, and I'll show you in a minute. But even in our Father, our Father who art in heaven. So hold a minute, He's omnipresent, yet He has an abiding presence in heaven. And we pray not to some figurine, not to something on this earth, but to God in heaven. Where is Jesus today? His abiding presence is in heaven. And he said that because he went back to heaven, he sent to us the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit now abides with us and abides in us. So lay a hold of the fact now that number one, he is omnipresent. Number two, he does not abide in time. And number three, he abides as an abiding presence in specific places. Okay? Solomon spoke, and I'm reading from... 2 Chronicles 6, 1. So this is Solomon at the dedication of the temple. Uh, then Solomon spoke. The Lord said he would dwell in dark cloud. I have surely built you an exalted house, a place for you to dwell forever. So hold him in here. We have God abides in heaven. Now we're told that we're building a temple, a house, so that God could abide. So there's an abiding place on this earth. Look at this, 2 Chronicles chapter 6, and I'm looking 19 through 21. Yet regard the prayer of your servant and his supplication, O Lord my God, and listen to the cry and the prayer which your servant is praying before you, that your eyes may be opened towards this temple night and day, towards this place where you said you would put your name, that you may hear the prayer which your servants make towards this place. And may you hear your supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they pray towards this place. Hear from heaven your dwelling place when you do hear and forgive. So we're praying, but here Solomon's talking about God, you are abiding, your presence is in this tabernacle, this temple. And of course, we know the glory of the Lord came, that Shekinah glory of his presence came. And where did it go? It went into the Holy of Holies. In fact, the, uh, in the Exodus, the children of Israel were given instructions regarding the building of a tabernacle and then ultimately the temple. In that, they were to build different chambers, the outer, the inner, and the Holy of Holies. In the Holy of Holies, there was to be the Ark of the Covenant, our testimony. On the top of that, that lid, where there were two cherubim, it was to be called the uh, mercy seat. And it's told, we're told in Scripture, that God would meet with us there because that's where the presence of God was, between the two cherubims, on the mercy seat in the Holy of Holies. So in this temple, in the tabernacle, the presence of God came and abided in a particular place, which was the Holy of Holies, right above the mercy seat between the two cherubims. It was a place so filled with the Shekinah glory that at that time you didn't touch the ark and you did not go into the presence beyond the veil 
unless you had a rope, unless you were carrying the blood. And there was a fear on those that went in beyond the veil that they would be struck dead. It was a holy place because it was the place of the presence. You think about even today that Orthodox Jews do not go up on the Temple Mount lest they step on the holy place. They uh, can have these tunnels underneath and they know they're so close to the holy place. And when they get to these places, they have to humble themselves because they recognize we are close to. And they may be a hundred yards, they may be quite a distance, but they are so close to. And that's the place where the presence dwelt. It meant everything. This is a place where the presence of God dwelt amongst us. And the Shekinah glory was there. In Exodus 40, verses 34 to 37, Then the cloud covered the tabernacle of meeting, and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And Moses was not able to enter the tabernacle of meeting because the cloud rested above it. And the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. And whenever the cloud was taken up above the tabernacle, the children of Israel would go onward on their journey. So the presence of God came in this manifested glory cloud that would come and abide in the tabernacle. And the only time it would leave the tabernacle, the Holy of Holies, and come out of this tent of meeting was when they were instructed to move forward. They were to follow the presence. And Moses then explains, listen, if your presence doesn't go with us, we're not going. And it was that presence, God abiding with them, that took this people who were the least among all people, God said, and made them the greatest. They were not the greatest because of their skill set, their large numbers. They were the greatest because the presence of God was with them, abiding with them in their midst, in this tabernacle, hidden behind a veil right above the mercy seat. And that presence, when they walked right and honored the presence, they were blessed above all nations. They were kept because of God's presence with them. Okay, now, um, in Deuteronomy chapter 26, this is verse 12a and 13a. It says, when you have finished laying aside all the tithe of your increase, then you shall say, before the Lord. And I want you to underline that word before. They were to come and they were to bring their tithes, their offerings before. And this is a face-to-face -face worship. They were to come before the presence. They were not just coming to a place of the omnipresence, but the abiding presence because they had a living relationship. Your worship has got to get beyond a worship of the omnipresent to the bringing of before the living God to His abiding presence where we come face to face and He is Lord. We recognize it because in His presence there is the Shekinah glory. There is a holy fear. And we do not walk um, without recognizing how holy He is. That He is a consuming fire. We look at all the things that he did regarding his presence in the Old Testament. And that's the presence that we're invited to come in and bring our worship. It should be the greatest thing all out. It should be a holy awe. It should be an honoring of the presence, the abiding presence of the living God. In Exodus 25, 8, and it says, And I will let them make me a sanctuary that I may dwell among them. Again, how was God going to dwell among the children of Israel? in a specific place, the Holy of Holies, in this tabernacle. So God allowed them to make them a place, a tabernacle, then a temple, in which His presence abided. Now, I could go into the book of Hebrews and explain how that tabernacle really spoke of the last dispensation. And we see that, of course, the, the, the temple is gone because of the dispensation that we are now living in, which is the dispensation of the church. If I go to 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 16, thinking, just talking a little bit about the presence here for a minute. Who alone has immortality, dwelling in unapproachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to him be the honor and everlasting power. Talking about the presence, and we've made the presence so casual 
and we've been so disrespectful because we've thought of it the omnipresence which we still should be walking in honor of because he knows he sees all things but there's something about coming into his abiding presence and realizing that as a believer he abides in us and with us and that when we gather together his abiding presence comes in our midst i believe that god's looking for real church services where they allow his abiding presence to come unfortunately we shut him out we don't want him coming in and we put a veil up in our flesh and our opinions and our ideas and we make the word of no power because of our traditions the the presence of god is not allowed to come and when the presence of god comes you think about all the things that jesus did you see the abiding presence of god in jesus and jesus is the testimony the witness of the heart the character the very thoughts of the father so when you think about the presence you think of jesus you gotta look at jesus and there is the fullness of the manifestation of the abiding presence no sickness could stand no no devil could stand in that presence no defeat it always brought victory and that's the abiding presence that wants to come and dwell amongst us when we gather together as believers to abide in us as an individual believer if we would honor that presence if we would give glory to him in acts 3 verse 19 paul said repent therefore and be converted that your sins be blotted out so that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the lord times of refreshing there's something about you know the the tangible abiding presence coming into a church and breathing on it it brings a freshness a new life we need these times of refreshing and an awakening new touches and it starts by us repenting see we want it on our terms but god says you need to repent of all the things that have hardened you to the sensitivity to the presence to the awareness of the presence of the living god that when we open the word this is living the presence of god abides in his word because he is the word and so again there's an honor given there's a respect given and we recognize it as authority instead of subjecting it to ours as if we were god we were lord he alone is god he can have no other gods before him and we must walk in that reverence and that respect and of his specific abiding presence i believe that we want revival and if we really want it then let us get hold of the powerful presence of god uh, oh, i got this verse i want to quote it to you in hebrews 9 verses 8 through 9. the holy spirit indicating this that the way into the holiest of all the holy of holies was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing talking about the tabernacle and the temple it was symbolic for the present time which both gifts and sacrifice are offered which cannot make him perfect in regard to conscience so that spoke of an old dispensation but that temple of course is gone and in first corinthians 3 verse 16 paul wrote do you not know that you are the temple of god and the spirit of god dwells in you and the word he used for temple was not the complex building but the holy of holies so more accurately what he said know you not that you are the holy of holies the place where the presence the abiding presence comes and dwells in you where he is enthroned where he comes that we might meet with him where in that abiding presence and he wants to abide in you so that we stand in a place of such union with him we have not fully appreciated how much we are so intimately in him one with him because we continue to walk like the stubborn bride that has to walk and do it our way we have not allowed him to fully bring us and make us one if we would so surrender and yield and allow him to make us one in him we would no longer live but christ in us this wonderful place of such unity intimacy with him as he abides in us and with us the authority that we take you cannot separate us from him everywhere we go when the enemy looks he doesn't see us he sees him we should be blessed all the blessings of deuteronomy 28 should be ours why because he's in us he is with us and our heart our intention our thoughts are aligned it has to be the more honor you give the presence 
the more you want everything in your life to align and not offend the presence. I don't want my thoughts, my intentions, my desires, anything of me to become a veil that would hinder or stop the wonderful abiding presence in my life. In Leviticus 26 verse 12, And I will make my Shekinah to dwell among you, and I will be to you Eloha, and you shall be a people before me. This was talking really about the church, the fullness of this, the mystery of it, of course, was the church. God's wonderful Shekinah glory, not just abiding with us, but in you, changing you from one level of glory to another, so that as He is, so too are you in this world, when you were in Him as the church, as a believer, in His abiding presence. Deuteronomy 6, verse 15. And it says, and I'm reading this from the Aramaic. For the Lord thy God is jealous. His Shekinah dwelleth in the midst of thee. Lest the anger of the Lord thy God be kindled against thee, and he destroy thee from the face of the earth. There has to be a walking reverence, absolute sensitivity, not seeking to so grieve. We can see why we are to judge ourselves and be careful how we walk because the presence of God, the holiness of God dwells in us and we must recognize who He really is and give Him the honor and allow Him to be enthroned on the throne of our heart in our affection. That every part of our life is subject and every time we miss it, we need to get back under the blood. We should be so quick to repent because of His abiding presence. The more conscious we become of His presence, the more we walk holy. We are more conscious of sin and the things of the world and not Him. Something's got to change. Something's got to change. Deuteronomy 12, 5, again reading from the Aramaic. But to the place, in the Aramaic course is the Bible that Jesus and the disciples read. But to the place which the Lord your God will choose, that his Shekinah may dwell there, unto the house of his Shekinah you shall seek. There's this wonderful place where God's presence wants to come and dwell amongst us in his glory. And you see that in powerful revivals. And that's why I love revivals, because you really see that Shekinah glory impacting individuals, impacting the church, and going beyond the four walls and reaching a region where God dwelled in such a powerful way that it changed the moral, the spiritual climate. It changed everything uh, as God moved in a region and His presence was there. In Colossians 1 verse 27, To them God willed to make known what are the riches of His glory of the mystery among the Gentiles, which is Christ in you, the hope of glory. Oh, that we would have eyes to see to fully lay hold of and appreciate this wonderful mystery, Christ in us, abiding in us, and the God, the Holy Spirit, transforming us, taking us from one level of glory to another. There's got to be a transformation in us if we recognize and receive His abiding presence. That's why the Holy Spirit wants to come and not just abide uh, in you but to so overwhelm, so that you are found in Him, is the way I want to explain it. We like that place of Him abiding in us, but He wants to take you to the place where you abide in Him, where all identity is lost, where all your you and your rights are lost and now found in Him, in this new place, kept by Him, overwhelmed by His presence, It is here that we walk with authority. It's here where we open the Word. There is a relationship with the Word, and God speaks to us through His Word, opening it, speaking life into us. And this is the place where He now lifts us so that we are able to be such a blessing, carrying that presence everywhere we go, having such an impact. No wonder the early church turned the world upside down. It was because of the abiding presence in them and understanding and really giving reverence to that abiding presence. 2 Corinthians 5, 6, and I'm going to finish with this. 
For it is God who has commanded light to shine out of the darkness and who has shone in your hearts to give the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. This face-to-face encounter and experience of His presence, to know Him every single day in the secret place. When we realize that the secret place belongs to Him, it's not a place that you can run and hide from Him, but rather that's the place to encounter Him to meet with His abiding presence, to have fellowship, relationship with Him, then you are going to be changed. There is fire there. There is a fresh touch. There's fresh vision. There's life there. When I take of that secret place in my life and I consecrate it to His abiding presence and I give honor and I want no filthy thing in my life, the Jews were not allowed any filthy thing into the land because His presence abided with them. Are you watching what gets into your life? Are you watching what you see and you hear? Because I want to honor the presence. The presence means everything to me. Oh, glory to God. I pray that you're receiving this. I pray this is blessing you and that you get such a revelation of the abiding presence of the living God that He is with you while He still abides in heaven. And I'm looking forward to the day where we will go and be fully with Him But in this wonderful mystery, while we're on this earth, He abides in us, and He abides with us. Our Jesus, oh, don't you just want to worship Him? Don't you just want to enthrone Him in your praises? Don't you just want to bring Him such glory and make sure that we never in any way distract from Him receiving the worship, that we never raise ourselves up, that we never put ourselves in the way of people experiencing the wonderful abiding presence. Jesus, receive all the honor. Holy Spirit, come and worship through us and lift up our Jesus. Come and bless the name of the Lord our God. We consecrate ourselves wholly, completely to you, Jesus. Take us deeper than we've ever been. Father God, let us walk in true holiness by your Spirit. Jesus, your word, let it be first and final authority in our lives. I thank you, Jesus. We worship you, Jesus. We give you the praise. We give you the praise. I thank you there's no distance, Father, in the Spirit. And for everyone watching, let them be so touched, even now. Let them experience your wonderful presence, even now, that Jesus, you might be glorified and lifted up. I bless them, Father. I bless them. I thank you for a refreshing that comes from your presence, a refreshing in you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. We bless you, Jesus. We come to receive. We come to receive. We give you honor. We give you the power. We give you the praise. Unto you, the glorious God, we give you praise. We give you worship. Amen. Well, I thank you for watching. I encourage you to check out more videos. May they bless you and encourage and strengthen you. And if they have, would you please like, share, and subscribe? Because as you do, you really help us with the algorithms at YouTube and Google. Let's have an impact together. And would you consider standing with us as a prayer partner? Whether you sign up officially by going to robertpairs.org and go into the partner page, and it costs you nothing, or just agree behind the scenes. The commitment is simply to be praying for us, for the backsliders, for impact, to have the right word that would minister and that the people's hearts be open to see and hear and that Jesus would be glorified. And then to pray for the partners and that as a consequence, you have partners praying for you, that at any moment God can turn and move at any single partner worldwide to pray for you when you need it. But you've got to be committed to pray for them. We are meant to be people praying together, praying for each other. What a thought. Amen. And if you want and you don't have currently right now a local church you're looking for one, consider joining our Sunday services uh, on Zoom. Uh, You'll receive a fresh now word to bless you and encourage you in these times. Amen. And if God puts in your heart to be a financial partner, we thank you as well. You can get more information on that by going to our website, robertpairs.org. I just want to bless you and I want to remind you as always that this is the day the Lord has made. We will rejoice and be glad in it because of, through, and for Him. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Thank you.